possibly that there is, first of all, an obligation to share benefits from the utilization of genetic resources according to MAP. This should be uh, spelled out. Um, that this obligation to share benefits also um, includes an uh, obligation to share benefits from the utilization of, from the subsequent application or commercialization of genetic resources. This means, for example, if a, if a resource was accessed in the past, and it is applied, um, let's say, for commercial, for non-commercial um, um, purposes, and later on, um, um, is a, the resources are applied um, or commercialized in a different uh, way. Then um, there's again an obligation to uh, share benefits. There is a recognition of the rights of indigenous and local communities over genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge that could be foreseen in um, ABS measures and important also to reflect that there are not only monetary benefits that could be um, part of the benefit sharing deal but also non-monetary benefits and um, an indicative list for both is given in the annex of the Nagoya Protocol um, which is based on an annex of the Bonn Guidelines it goes back to that document. And last but not least very important also the process for negotiating mutually agreed terms and minimum criteria uh, to be fulfilled. <coughs> um, traditional knowledge, just um, a quick one on that, um, since we've seen already the, uh, the film from Natural Justice. Um, the Nagara Protocol also promotes um, and, and uh, requires uh, the parties to take measures which aim at considering customary laws, community protocols and procedures, also to support the indigenous uh, and local communities in the development of such instruments which will facilitate um, and clarify the procedures for accessing such traditional knowledge and sharing benefits. And what is um, highly important is that um, information is provided to potential users about their obligations with regard to traditional knowledge as we've seen in our uh, fictitious case again, um, only one indigenous and local communities has um, developed a biocultural community protocol, which should, if it's drafted properly, um, clarify the access procedure and the way you should engage with this um, community. However, the other one, although they are quite close um, uh, with regard to their beliefs and uh, the way they use um, natural resources, did not have the chance or um, did not yet develop such a, a community protocol. So with regard to the way um, of engaging with these people, it might not be entirely clear um, what procedures need to be followed. The, the compliance um, aspect is um, a very complex and difficult issue to and, and this is probably also one of the reasons why so few ratifications um, and also few parties have ratified the Nagoya Protocol so far because the compliance um, obligations under the Nagoya Protocol are quite complex, they go quite far and um, um, there is not much precedence in, from implementation of, of other international agreements with, with this regard. You see in this on this table that there are different compliance related um, provisions in the Nagoya Protocol 15, 16, 17, 18 and 30 but the objective of these um, uh, provisions is different it is important to understand that Article 30 um, talks about compliance with the obligations under the Nagoya Protocol so the um, obligations at the international level while 15 and 16 talk about um, measures that need to be taken in order to ensure that the legislation of the provider country um, is not violated. So it tries to um, uh, prevent uh, future um, cases of misappropriation. Article 17 refers to monitoring utilization of generic resources, um, which um, is related to Article 15. And 18 then again um, addresses the implementation of ABS contracts um, compliance with the actual private or uh, public pro
private uh, agreements that were reached. So this needs to be differentiated. Now, user measures to provide for compliance with provider countries, ABS legislation related to genetic resource and associated traditional knowledge is um, what I said, um, regulated in articles 15 and 16. There is first of all a general obligation of um, users to comply with the provider countries' ABS measures. Second, there um, is an obligation for user for users to um, for user countries to take measures in order to address potential cases of non-compliance with the um, with the actually that's a mistake with the provider no with their user country measures. So if they actually breach their own legislation, um, there should also be. Um, consequence uh, related to that. And last but not least, the yeah, uh, Nagoya Protocol also calls for cooperation um, in cases between provider and user countries in uh, cases of alleged violations in order to clarify whether those allegations are based on any uh, true facts. Concrete compliance measures um, could include, first of all, you could um, decide to prohibit the utilization of general, general resources which were accessed in violation of provider countries' APS legislation. However, if you introduce such um, a, prohib uh, um, a provision that simply prohibits the utilization, this would actually mean that also the user country has the, um, the obligation to check and to monitor each individual case probably whether the user complied with the provider country's ABS legislation. That would create a huge bureaucracy and would probably not be feasible. Um, another approach that has been suggested is the establishment of due diligence obligations for users, which actually only um, uh, would foresee an obligation for users, such as the pharmaco company, to set up their own due diligence systems, kind of um, standards, that uh, they need to, that were identified um, uh, beforehand, that need to be reached. And then the user uh, country, the um, user country's um, National Biodiversity Authority, for example, would only check whether these, these due diligence systems were established and whether the criteria that the company or the standards that the company uh, set for themselves um, would um, be in compliance with the standards that were set. Um, development of sector-specific codes of conduct and guidelines is another more flexible um, um, com compliance measure that uh, could be taken. However, those codes of conduct and guidelines are uh, normally um, not legally binding and therefore um, maybe not as effective. Um, as I said before, with regard to the user measures uh, that need to be taken in case there is a violation of a user within the national jurisdiction, meaning that um, a researcher or company has violated the um, ABS obligations um, or ABS provisions of the provider country, um, proportionate sanctions and penalties for breaches of such third country's ABS legislation is an important point, otherwise um, this will, um, uh, these measures will probably not, not really work. The framework for monitoring utilization of genetic resources uh, needs to be set up. This is regulated in Article 17 and it refers um, to two important aspects. First of all, the setting up or the designation of checkpoints, so-called checkpoints. And the second aspect is the, um, the creation of um, an international certificate of compliance. According to the Nagoya Protocol, each, each country, again, each country meaning ne um, regardless of whether the um, party considers itself as a um, classical provider or user country, each party has to set, designate at least one checkpoint. You can designate only one, but um, it can also designate more checkpoints. Um, the most prominent um, checkpoint that was probably discussed was the application process for patents. So the patent office could be a possible checkpoint. However, additional checkpoints uh, could be established at uh, the stage of uh, product approval um, with regard to the granting of public research funds, 
um, standards for academic uh, publications. Um, so before um, a publication is put on the market um, or is disseminated, um, this could, um, could be checked whether there is a breach of provider countries ABS legislation. Domestic ABS measures furthermore need to clarify the specific roles and functions of the checkbots. This is um, addressed only very, uh, in a very um, general way in the Nagoya Protocol. Which information does a checkpoint actually have to collect? What does the user have to provide to a checkpoint? This is not specified. There are certain qualifiers, adjectives included in the Nagoya Protocol, but um, that's not specific enough for domestic implementation. And as I said, the introduction of a certificate of compliance will um, be an important point in order to operationalize the Nagoya Protocol. Um, the permits for granting access need to be published in the ABS Clearinghouse um, that uh, Andreas already explained in the morning. Um, and those permits may become internationally um, recognized certificates. So providing evidence for a user that he or she is, was in compliance with provider countries uh, ABS legislation when accessing the resource. <coughs> and from the, from the um, domestic ABS measures perspective, of course, it would help to recognize, first of all, the certificate as evidence for prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms, and also to regulate uh, perhaps the minimum content um, that a permit um, has in order to later on qualify as an internationally recognized certificate. Last part is the institutional framework. Um, Article 13 of the Nagoya Protocol um, um, calls upon states to designate um, a national focal point which will um, uh, have the role of facilitating, let's say, the, uh, the ABS procedures by providing uh, important information to uh, an interested user. Um, furthermore, one or more competent national authorities uh, should be designated. The competent national authority would then be the um, institution that takes the decision um, uh, with regard to prior informed consent and that um, also negotiates the mutually agreed terms. However, depending again on the national context, the country can decide to have a national focal point as well as several competent national authorities, but it could also decide to you know, have only a national focal point which is at the same time the competent national authority. So again, this indicates that um, the, the Nagoya Protocol provides a lot of flexibility. Um, the way the institutional framework will look at the end will be influenced again by the nature of the governmental institutions that are already existing in a country and that are overseeing competence uh, components of biodiversity. As we all know, the competencies with regard to um, uh, national resource governance is often divided. You might have a protected areas uh, agency, at the same time an agency dealing with um, endangered species and, and so on and so forth, uh, an agency um, focusing on uh, marine issues, etc. So this um, Fragmented approach will, um, if there is a fragmented approach, um, this will of course not facilitate um, access to genetic resources. And what is important again to keep in mind: if there is no access, there will also, from the provider country's perspective, there will no will not be benefit sharing in the end. So there is this incentive to create uh, um, an ABS, a domestic ABS regime, which is actually you know workable, which is which is effective but which is also efficient and does require the, for the, the interested user to um, perhaps collect um, zillions of, of permits from different institutions that have a, have a say in this process. So possible approaches to reduce uh, such transaction costs uh, can be a procedural integration, so that means that a competent, uh, the competent agencies could coordinate amongst themselves their procedures and conditions of granting access permits. But there could also be the, um, um, uh, another option is to fully integrate um, these, these um, institutional frameworks, which means that there would, in the end, only be one permit that the user needs to be applied, uh, that the user needs to um, apply for. 
Last point, um, just for your interest, we um, are about to, to launch at the upcoming conference of the parties of the CBD an explanatory guide to the Nagoya Protocol where we run through the whole agreement um, um, article by article um, in order to explain how these different terms that are utilized and uh, the different provisions that we, we read, which are quite complex, can be understood. And it also tries to provide some ideas uh, with regard to this subject, um, the way forward after the Nagoya Protocol enters into force and already what needs to be done uh, in view of entry into force. So thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, of course, uh, ask them. Thanks.
be a potential forum to address those cases. However, if you read the Nagura protocol, it's quite clear that this is, at least from my perspective, not the case because it only addresses compliance with the international instrument to comp the obligations under the, um, the Nagoya Protocol. In your case, is an issue of compliance at the national level. For this, we have these provisions 15, 16, and 17, or depending on what kind of non-compliance is it, if it's only a breach of the contract, then it would be actually um, you know, a contract issue that would need to be solved. So in Right now, there is no, let's say, um, ombudsman um, or special forum which is created to deal with those or procedures you know, that, that deals with those cases. However, uh, the Nagoya, Nagoya Protocol actually includes obligations to take measures um, in order to deal with these cases. One is, as I said, you know, there's an obligation to cooperate between the um, disputing parties in case of an alleged violation. So the parties should first of all try to, to you know, settle the dis uh, dispute, maybe refer it to uh, a neutral um, forum, mediation uh, process, etc.